All right, now we have our scripture reading today, and our scripture today is Titus 2. Titus 2, and it is entitled, What Must Be Taught to Various Groups. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, and to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal them from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. And that is our scripture reading today. Young children may be dismissed for Children's Church. Thank you for the springtime when we see the renewal of life. And Father, most of all, we thank you as Easter's coming up that you were willing to send Jesus Christ, that he would die for our sins, so that we could be renewed, that we could be born again, that we could have life eternal, that we could spend eternity with you, Father. What an awesome portrayal of your love for us, and we thank you so much for that. Bless this service today. Bless each and everyone here. And may your spirit fill our hearts and our minds. And may we be obedient to the words that you would have us hear. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue talking about the prodigal son today. And I know that wasn't what Titus was over. Titus was over about teaching for the gospel's sake. So we're going to learn from a parable because that's how Jesus taught. So that we can apply those things not only to our lives, but we can live a life that will hopefully... Um, show light to others as well. The prodigal son passage, or the lost son passage, you can find in Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. And I'm going to start with Luke 15, verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. And the New Living Translation said to illustrate his point further, Jesus went on with this parable. He had already had two parables that he had taught One was about the lost sheep, and one was about a lost coin. So you're starting to see a pattern develop here that that we mean something to God. He doesn't want to lose any one of us, and that's why Jesus came. Also, if you look at the Scriptures, you'll see that He's talking to two groups of people. He's talking to the tax collectors and sinners, and He's talking to the Pharisees. And many times He had encounters with Pharisees, so He had to sit there and teach to them in such a way that hopefully they would get it, but so many times their mind was closed to hearing them. And this parable, you remember a man had two sons. If you were here last week, you know that we went over the older son, who's not as apparent from the story at first, but he's a lost son also. He is lost in his self-righteousness, in his works, in his ability to do things, in his ability to save him. He was on the father's land, but he had no idea how lost that he was. This younger son, though, obvious how lost he is because he goes to a pagan land and spends his money wildly and then comes to his senses. So that's what this sermon is entitled today. It's called Coming to Your Senses. And sometimes we all need to come to our senses. 
In Matthew 9, verse 13, it reads, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The older son had no idea. If you looked at his life, here was a life that was led, that he was obedient to his father, he was faithful, he worked hard, but his heart wasn't what it was supposed to be. God looks at man's hearts. He doesn't look at the actions. He desires mercy, not sacrifices, not deeds. He desires a pure heart that wants to serve Him wholeheartedly. Jesus in this um, passage in Matthew had just called Matthew to come to Him. And guess who Matthew was? He was one of those rotten, sinner tax collectors, wasn't he? And at that same time, the Pharisees saw Jesus, and I'll read Matthew 9, 11 through 13 so you can get a little more picture of it. It says, When the Pharisees saw this, they asked His disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? They just could not understand this. On hearing this, Jesus answered them. He said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I looked at some other translations to see what that verse said, the 13th verse, just to get a different idea. And in the New Living Translation, it says, I want want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. The English Standard Version says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The International Standard Version says, For it is love that I seek and not sacrifice, knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The Net Bible says, For I delight in faithfulness, not simply in sacrifice. I delight in acknowledging God, not simply in whole burnt offerings. Are you seeing a pattern here, what God desires? God's Word translation says, I want your loyalty not your sacrifices. I want you to know me, not give me burnt offerings. And the message says, I'm after love that lasts, not more religion. I want you to know God, not go to more prayer meetings. So Jesus wants your love. Yes, if you love Him, you will have actions. But if you have actions just like the older son did without the loving heart, then it's kind of worthless and meaningless to God because He knows the heart. At first, you didn't know that the older son was lost till you read the story far enough and you saw his reaction to his dad and when the brother came home. He didn't want any part of it. He was so self-absorbed, said, I deserve, I want this. What all have I done for you, Father? He didn't want to welcome his brother back. He didn't want to be obedient to his father. He just wanted what was coming to him, just like the first son. But God wants us to seek him, to love him with all of his heart, to all of our heart, and to make that known to others so that they'll know, they'll see a difference in us, and they'll desire to have what we have. Our works, deeds, and offerings cannot take the place of our heart. They can be icing on the cake, but they can't take the place. Jesus, God wants a heart that is fully committed to Him, that will serve only Him, that will have no other gods before Him. So the older brother, kind of like the Pharisee, wasn't he? And they didn't really understand or hear what Jesus was saying. So three different times, He's giving them the importance of those that are lost. But yet the sinners and tax collectors came to hear Him. Mark twelve thirty three says this, To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength. And to love your neighbor. Guess what? That's thrown in there as yourself, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. The older son claimed to be found. He claimed to be a son of the father. He claimed to be a brother. But his actions did not show that. He did not love his neighbor. He didn't love with all of his heart. No one can serve two masters, Scripture says. You will either hate one and love the other, but you can't love both. You can't love yourself. You can't love the riches of this world and love God at the same time. Your heart has to be totally committed to Him. So do you think from last week's 
um, sermon, do you think that the older brother, do you think his actions made the father proud? Do you think he was the kind of brother that he should have been? If we do apply that to teaching when we teach others, do our lives, do our actions glorify God? Do they let others know that we love them despite of their actions, whether they're tax collectors or not? Do they know that we love God with all of our hearts? Do we glorify Him and do we draw others to Jesus Christ? God seeks our heart rather than our sacrifices. Titus 3.5 begins this way, He saved us not because of righteous things which we have done, but because of His mercy. Works will not save us. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. And God loved us so much that He gave His Son to take away our sins if we would just believe. And here the Pharisees are not willing to hear what Jesus is having to say. The Son of God is standing before them explaining everything, but yet they're blinded by their own self-righteousness and hypocrisy. If you go back a chapter before Luke 15 and you go back to the end of Luke 14, it says, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And then Luke 15, 1 starts this way. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to do what? Hear Jesus. That's what they were there for. They knew that they were lost. They weren't caught up in their self-righteousness and their hypocrisy. They knew they were lost. Maybe they found the answers that day. Maybe they didn't. But they knew they were lost and they were willing to listen. Where the Pharisees and the older brother could not even hear because of their own righteousness screaming out. They were not willing to even hear who Jesus was and the message that He was preaching. Starting with the parable of the lost son in verse 12, it says, The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. The message says, I want it right now, what's coming to me. And the New Living Translation adds in before you die. So if you don't understand that, what's happening is the younger brother says, I want mine now. And we see that in the world today, especially in the world we live in here in the United States, because we think things are entitled to us. How many times do we we battle with teenagers? I don't want to be in your house anymore. I want what I deserve. But the biggest thing is most of us parents won't give them what they ask for. But in this case, the father does. What he's telling his dad is, I don't care about you. All I care about is your money, your possessions. And I want them now, so you might as well be dead to me. I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about waiting until you die. I want what's coming to me now. And you owe me. I don't know about you, but when I calculate up what my son owes me for raising him, I don't come up with a figure that I owe him. Maybe it's just my thoughts. Maybe I'm blinded by that. But I do it out of love, so there's no owing anybody anything. But it's just funny how much we think we're entitled to things in this world. He had no respect for his father whatsoever. Logically, I'm going to assume this. This is not in scriptures, but I'm going to assume that he worked very little for his father. Because just from knowing teenagers enough, and I'm not cutting teenagers by any means, because we all were teenagers at one point. We all can relate to these things. But when we reached that point where we wanted to be out on our own, we didn't want to listen to our parents anymore. We wanted to be our own boss. But like I said, we didn't have the money. So if he's saying this, I'm just putting two and two together, that I think he probably didn't work much for his inheritance either. And the older brother had been working. So he just said, I want it now. I've done nothing for it whatsoever. You can die, but I want what's coming to me. That's what he was saying. No rules, no worries, right? That's going to answer our question. I mean, answer our desires. Problem is, Satan's a deceiver. Go back to the book of Genesis, and after creation, you see Satan coming on the scene, and he deceives. He wants to tear us away from a relationship with God. He's not going to tell you that those things provide temporary satisfaction. He's not going to tell you what's going to happen when things get bad and you hit rock bottom. He's simply going to tell you, hey, this way is better. This will fill your needs. This drug will give you the high that you're looking for. 
This new car will give you the status that you're looking for. This job will give you what you've been looking for for your time and, and for your esteem. Whatever those things are, He will appeal to you with those. He won't come and say, hey, let me destroy your life. He will come and deceive you. So the younger son said, I want my money so I can leave. And I don't know if you're familiar either with what was customary in that time, but the inheritance usually was the older son got two-thirds of what the father had upon his passing, and he became the patriarch, so to speak, of the family. And the younger son got one-third, and he would answer to the older brother. The older brother had authority over him. Not in this case. He said to his older brother, also, I don't want any part of you. I want my money and my freedom so that I can get out of here and live a life the way I want to live. He was leaving his heritage as well as leaving his father when he left. And the older son, don't forget, he got his money too, didn't he? So sure, he might stay around the house and do the chores and take care of the tasks, wouldn't he? Because he's got his money. Why would you want to jeopardize that? Especially now that the younger brother is out of the way, if this presented this much profit, evidently the father was a wealthy man, why would you not want to stay in that family business? So it's not like the older brother was really doing that much. He was taking advantage of the situation. He was glad that his brother was out of there. But we don't see that until later into the story. But the younger brother leaves, literally takes the money and runs, right? To live a life that Satan tells him will be satisfying. So back to verse 13. It says, Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. The King James Version says he wasted his substance with riotous living, and the New Living Translation says that he wasted all his money. He had nothing left. He didn't think about the future. He didn't have anybody there to tell him, hey, you need to save up for a rainy day. He spent all his money that he had as fast as he could in riotous living. He abandoned his heritage. He went off to a distant country. That's not something the people of that time did. When they did that, he left his heritage of being a Jew. He went to a pagan land. He left his heritage that he was trained up in Scripture and everything and went to a land that worshipped idols. He was totally and hopelessly lost. Obvious that this son is lost. And his wild living would cost him his wealth. Funny thing, like I said, is the devil never mentions that, does he? Everything will be fine. He doesn't mention it when you take that first drag off that joint that you may get addicted to it. Or that when you start down a lifestyle of pursuing money that that may become your God. He tells you you need these things to find happiness. That you don't need God. That God is a dictator. He's not a loving God. But God loved you so much that He loved you when you were a tax collector and sinner. And He sent Jesus Christ to die for you. Verse 14 says, After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. The New Living Translation says, About the time that his money ran out, he began to be in need. And the message says he began to hurt. The New Living Translation says he began to starve. That's the thing that this young son was feeling. He had hit rock bottom, or at least he thought he had hit rock bottom. He had no money left, no friends, no family, He was a foreigner, lost. Proverbs 13.25 says, The righteous eat to their heart's content, but the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. Solomon wrote that. You remember we talked about him before. The wisest fool that ever lived. Read Ecclesiastes and see how much that the things of this world mattered to him after he came to his senses. I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but right when his money ran out, He hits rock bottom, right? There's a famine. Not only is there a famine, but there's a severe famine. Not only did it affect his region, but it affected the whole country. You can't run and hide from God. Your sins will find you out. And a lot of times your sins will bring havoc down on other people. Do you remember Jonah? We remember that story well. He tried to run from God. What happened? Everyone on the ship were facing their loss of their lives because of the storm that was out there. And then he thought he hit rock bottom when they threw him over. But instead, he hadn't hit rock bottom yet. He was swallowed by a fish and spent three days inside the belly of a fish. 
don't know about you, I enjoy fishing. I heard someone talking about fishing in the back today, but didn't have a fishing license, right, Ed? I enjoy fishing, but when I come home, my hands stink. They're slimy. And it's hard to get that washed off in it. Even the next day, you kind of smell and feel the slime. Could you imagine being inside of a fish for three days? Total darkness. I don't know how, I know how my stomach acid is, and I choke on it. I don't know about the fish's acid, but he's probably got stomach acid sitting there eating away at him and rotten food in there. That's rock bottom, guys. The, the storm on the ship wasn't that bad. Let's look at the passage. In Jonah 1, 8 through 10, it says, So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? They knew that this calamity had brought up, been brought upon them because this guy was running from God. From what, from what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And then if we skip down to verse 15, it says, Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. I don't know if that happened when this young man decided to leave the country or not. The parable doesn't say but many times when you're running from God, you will bring havoc not only on yourself, but those around you. If you're a child of God, you belong to the Father. Your life is not your own. It has been purchased with a horrific price with the blood of Jesus Christ. You are part of His story, not your own story. And that's a privilege, not condemnation. It's a privilege to know that you can live a life that would bless the living God that you were created to worship and bring honor to Him. And we get sidetracked by the devil because we think we need these things that will bring us happiness, when true happiness is only found in Jesus Christ. But back to the story. Has the sun hit rock bottom yet? Well, here's what verse 15 says. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. You've got to relate back to the times. We don't think anything about feeding pigs as much now other than it's probably kind of dirty and smelly. But in this time, Jews were not supposed to associate with pigs at all. They were unclean. So not only has he left his Jewish heritage, but he's doing the exact opposite. He has to associate with those pigs. The New Living Translation says that he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. So it wasn't easy. This is a time of famine. People didn't know if they could feed themselves. So why would they hire an outsider? Maybe they would have hired him when he was flashing his money around and things were good, but they're not going to hire him now. And don't you dare think that the guy wasn't going to take advantage of him. It's obvious that he did because even when he's slopping the pigs, he didn't have enough money to feed himself. So the guy took adva- gave him a job, but he took advantage of him. Why would he want to help him? The farmer had to be persuaded to let him slop pigs. The son didn't have enough money to even eat adequately, and he had to feed pigs. Leviticus 11, 7 and 8 says this, and this is what he was raised on, and the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. So even in our worst times, when we're down and out, I don't know how many times we're dealing with stuff that's spiritually unclean to us. But that's what this young man had to face. Not only was he rock bottom, but he had to face dealing with things that he knew in his heart were unclean for him. He had to give up and humble himself totally. Verse 16, He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So he worked slopping pigs, but yet he didn't get enough money paid to him to feed himself. The New Living Translation says he became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. And the King James Version says he would feign to have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. I don't know if you know what feign means, but feign means gladly, eagerly desiring. Not only to eat pig slop, but to fill his stomach with pig slop. Literally to pig out on pig slop, right? 
if you've ever slopped pigs, you put anything and everything in that bucket that you take to the fit pigs because they will eat it. You put rotten milk in there. You put moldy bread in there. You put grease in there. You put weeds out of the garden there. You put rotten fruit and vegetables in there. And it may sit there a little bit before you take it out because you want to fill the bucket up. You don't want to go out twice. And if this guy had a trough, you might pour it in the trough. If not, you pour it right out in the pig mud. Well, what's in the pig mud? They defecate in their mud also. So that's what you're eating. And he longed not only to do that, but to do that from something that was spiritually unclean for him. So this guy had no hope left. He definitely hit rock bottom. He couldn't save himself. And as Christians, if we get that way, there's always hope. And I'm so glad that Jesus taught that principle in this. Because with Jesus, all you've got to do is turn around. And He's standing there with loving arms waiting to bring you back if you're His child. Even if you're not His child. I love the next verse, 17. When He came to His senses... That implies that he was being ridiculously stupid, doesn't it? When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death, dying of hunger? No matter what land you're in, no matter what things you're in, there's nothing that you can do that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. But you have to make the choice to get up out of the pig slop and come to him. If you are a son, Jesus is there the whole time with you during this too. Don't forget that. He never left you. He never left His Son in that land. He was there with Him the whole time. You don't see it at the time. Like the poster says, where where were you, Jesus, when all the hard times in my life, because I only saw one set of footprints in the sand. You don't realize that that was Jesus' footprints carrying you through that. But He came to His senses... And he did something about it. The New Living Translation says, finally came to his senses. How long was it going to take you to realize? When you ran out of money and you couldn't feed yourself, was that not hello? But it wasn't. Instead, you had to slop pigs and desire to fill your belly with pig slop before you realized that you had a father to return home to. It was right in front of his face the whole time. Psalms 119.59 says, I have considered my ways... And I have turned my steps to your statues. Good advice. God's way is the right way. It's the only way. We talked about three steps before. So I'm going to give you three steps again. This is three steps that I saw the son finally come out of his stupidity and realize. He came to his senses. He considered and examined his foolish ways. And then he turned back to his father. And you can read on. I'm not going to read what the father's response was, but we know that he was welcomed. We know the brother's response. But I will read this. Verse 18 says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So where is he going? He's going home. Home is where your father is. And it's where you belong. When you finally come to your senses, there's one place you can go to. Home to Jesus. He'll be there waiting on you. So the son did that. He was lost, but he decided to be found by Jesus, by his father. Verse 19 says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34 says this, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Remember this man had two sons. Both of them were lost. And the father eagerly waited the return of both of them. The older brother was lost in his self-righteousness and his hypocrisy. The younger brother was obviously lost in his love for the world, for wealth, for things that he thought would please him. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is addressing the crowd again. It says, And Jesus said to the crowd and to the disciples, the teachers of law, and guess what? And the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. 
It goes on in verse 13 and further to give you eight woes. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. Why? Because they're hypocrites. So this man had two lost sons. One that was obviously lost in his sin and depravity. One that was lost in his hypocrisy. A woe is an exclamation of judgment from God. A great sorrow and sadness to all who fail to recognize the true misery of their condition without Jesus Christ. If you're like either one of these sons, come to your senses. And there's all been times where we have not been in our right mind, in our right senses. If you wonder what Titus 2 was about this morning, it was about striving to do good. Why? For the sake of the gospel. So that others can see, so that we can teach those who are sons. And who those that aren't sons we can be examples to, so that we can draw them to their heavenly Father. Titus 2, 2 said, Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-control, sound in faith, in love and endurance. How do you think that story would have been different if the older son would have responded that way? Verses 6 through the beginning of verse 8 says, Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. And everything set them as an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. Again, I ask, what if a younger brother would have acted this way? I guess we wouldn't have had as much to learn from, would we? But look at what the difference, just think about it. What would have been different there in that story? What great things we could have seen differently. Not that what we saw wasn't great, because we see the Father's love out of the story. We see that no matter how bad things get, whether if we're caught up in self-hypocrisy or if we're caught up in the world, that our Father is waiting for us to return home. Jesus spoke in parables, though, to those who were willing to listen. You have to seek out His Word. You have to seek out what He's telling you through His Spirit and apply it to your lives. There has to be a response. You can't just listen to it and not get up out of the pig slop. We don't know if the older brother changed his mind or not. The story is open-ending. We don't know what happened to him. But when you learn from Scripture, when God reveals something through you to His Spirit, if you don't apply it, you're still sitting in the mud or you're still sitting in your self-hypocrisy. Titus 2, 11 through 14 said, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do what is good. God loves you so much. If you think that you're not home, I ask you to come to your senses and go home. He's there waiting for you. Got a video that I'm going to play, or Logan's going to play. I'm not. I'm up here. And it talks about keep making me because it's a process. But you've got to realize, and you've got to ask God to help you. You've got to return to Him. So, Logan, if you're ready. Got one more example for you. You remember David, and you remember that God called him a man after his own heart. That wasn't what other people called him. That's what God called him. He fell in the pig slop too. You know that if you've read the Scriptures. He fell into adultery with Bathsheba and then committed murder as a result to try to cover up his sin. But he came to his senses. It took someone else coming to him and saying, do you see what you did to finally come to his senses? But he came to his senses. And like I said, God called him a man after his own heart. And Debbie, Debbie, Debbie usually reads closing, so I am going to close with this Scripture. This is what David wrote after that time period when he realized that he needed to get out of the pig slop, turn around and head back to God. Psalms 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. 
Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Father, we thank you for the time that we can read your word, where we can come together as your people. Help us to get rid of any of the things in our lives, whether it's slop or hypocrisy or any other things, Father, so that we may bring glory and honor to you. We pray that your church will be a blessing, a sweet fragrance, that our hearts will cry out to you, that you will blot out our transgressions, you will deliver us from evil, and you will bring us home one day to spend eternity with you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You guys are dismissed.